Hello and welcome to the January webinar from the IEA Clean Coal Centre. My name is Stephen Mills and I'm a Senior Analyst and Author at the Centre. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports which are available from our website at www.iea-coal.org. After one-off registration, residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download, download our reports free of charge. Please visit our website for details. Now today's webinar is based on my latest report, The Prospects for Coal and Clean Coal Technologies in Greece. They discuss current coal use, in this particular case it's lignite, its possible, possible importance to the Greek economy in the coming years, and the sort of factors that could influence the level of use we might see. The report will be published shortly and will be available on our website. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please use the Ask a Question box at the top of your screen. Add your email address so I can send you a full answer if we run out of time or if a more detailed response would be appropriate. So just to set the scene a little, well, Greece is situated to the southeast of Europe. It's bordered by Albania, the former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, with Bulgaria to the north and Turkey to the east. To the east is the Aegean, to the south the Mediterranean, and to the west the Ionian Sea. The country consists of a large mainland with two additional smaller peninsulas projecting from it, the Chalkidiki and the Peloponnese. Alongside the mainland there are also a large number of islands of various size. Mainland Greece accounts for about 83% of the country's total land mass and the country has a population of around 11.3 million. It's been a member of the EU since 1981. Now, Greece's financial crisis continues to have major impacts on all aspects of the country's economy. Recent years have seen this contract by nearly a quarter. Investment in the country has collapsed by almost two-thirds and imports of many goods and commodities has halved. The recent period has seen the deepest and most protracted peacetime recession in the country's history. It'll come as no surprise that, well, as shown by the figure here, the downturn in the economy has meant there's been a significant drop in the demand for electricity. Now, during the last couple of years, there were a few tentative signs that the economy might be picking up. For example, in 2013, Greece achieved a primary surplus, and in 2014, manufacturing expanded slightly. However, as everyone is only too well aware, in 2015, the financial crisis continued seemingly unabated, and as yet, there's little to suggest that the Greek economy will enjoy serious recovery in the near future. However, when economic recovery does begin, the energy sector will have a major role to play in this, in this, in this. Now, Greece imports a lot of its energy. It has a high energy import dependency. Almost all of its oil and gas is sourced from abroad, and this amounts to almost two-thirds of its gross inland energy consumption. And as you can see from this figure, the country's highest import dependency level came in 2008, when it topped 73%, although this has since fallen. In 2013, it was still high at 62%. Now, compared to other EU member states, the overall diversification of the energy mix is considered to be rather limited. In terms of security of energy supply, the high dependence on imported oil makes Greece one of the most vulnerable states in the EU. Of the EU28, Greece is the 10th largest energy importer. Now, aside from security issues, importing energy is also expensive. Reportedly, the current level is around 20 billion US dollars a year. Now, Greece's main indigenous energy resource is lignite. Proven reserves of other fossil fuels are meagre. In the case of oil, well, the country only produces about 6,500 barrels a day, whereas consumption is actually 450,000. So Greek production hardly makes a dent in the overall demand. The bulk of the country's oil is imported, mostly from OPEC and former Soviet Union countries. Currently, a significant proportion, over 40% in fact, comes from Russia. Oil imports currently cost Greece around 10 billion euros a year. In the case of gas, well, like oil, Greek gas reserves and production are small. Set against the scale of demand, domestic production is, is negligible. So, like oil, most gas is imported, mainly from Russia, Azerbaijan via, via Bulgaria and Turkey, with much of the remainder coming in the form of liquefied natural, natural gas from Algeria. Forecasts for 2016 suggest that imported gas will cost around 2.4 billion US dollars. Which brings us to lignite. 
Greek coal reserves are almost entirely made up of lignite and this is abundant in several regions. It's of strategic importance to the country and is used almost exclusively for power generation and in some cases co-generation. The state-owned Public Power Corporation, or PPC, is the biggest producer. However, although lignite is plentiful, the quality of most deposits is poor. And we'll talk about Greek lignite a bit more shortly. Overall, fossil fuels are of particular importance to the Greek economy. More than 93% of Greece's energy is provided by fossil fuels, compared to the European average of 75%. Now, as in many other countries, a priority of previous Greek governments focused on, and to use their words, the provision of a secure, uninterrupted supply of energy capable of meeting national requirements. The intended strategy was to access a variety of energy resources, boost the use of domestic lignite and increase the uptake of renewable energies. Alongside this, the energy sector was to be systematically liberalised and monopolising the electricity and natural gas sectors ended, a move aimed at increasing private sector participation. However, following the election of January 2015, the new government stopped all energy-related privatisations. They also announced plans for the greater use of domestic lignite for electricity generation, a move intended mainly to reduce the country's dependence on expensive imported sources of energy. However, since these announcements were made, the situation has become somewhat less clear. And under the conditions demanded by EU and IMF creditors prior to the dispersion of the most recent tranche of Greece's 240 billion euro bailout, it appears that, once again, privatisation schemes may be back on the table. If, it, if this happens, it's likely to encompass both natural gas and electricity supply. The government's intention to significantly boost the use of lignite for power generation also appears to have changed. More recent announcements seem to indicate that this stance may have softened with emphasis shifting towards the greater use of renewable energies. As I've already mentioned, Greek coal reserves are almost entirely made up of lignite. This is available in several regions with proved reserves of between 3.9 and 5 billion tonnes. All lignite mining is carried out using open cast methods. There's no deep mining. As a result, production costs are low. In fact, they're lower than those in most other European lignite producing countries. Recent production has varied between 54 and 60 million tonnes a year. Now, in terms of EU production, Greek lignite output ranks third after Germany and Poland and sixth in the world. The use of indigenous lignite, particularly for power generation, helps reduce energy import requirements and consequently makes an important contribution towards the country's economy. So, Greek lignites have good points and not so good points. We've mentioned that the country has quite a lot of lignite and it's cheap to reduce. This all helps keep electricity prices down. But on the other hand, most Greek lignites are characterised as low rank, mainly with low CVs and high ash and moisture contents. Furthermore, depending on the source, properties can vary widely, both between and within different geographical regions, or even within individual scenes. As a result, the quality of mine lignite can vary considerably in all timescales. This in itself can create problems in power plants that were designed to operate on a supply of lignite with properties that fall within specified parameters. Well, in the case of hard coal, well, Greece has no hard coal reserves worth, worth speaking of, and therefore none is produced. <coughs> it, retire, it relies entirely on imports to meet its requirements, but having said that, only a modest amount is imported. In 2010, it was 158 kilotons. In 2013, it was down to 100 kilotons. This is used mainly by the cement sector and in metals production, although small amounts are also sometimes used as support fuel, added when necessary to power plant lignite feed. And this has happened, for example, at the Cardia power plant in Greece. Now, PPC is Greece's largest power generator, electricity supplier and lignite producer. The company's current power portfolio consists of conventional thermal, and this is oil, gas and lignite power, plus hydroelectric and other renewables based power plants. Combined, these make up approximately two thirds of Greek installed generating capacity. An important part of this are a handful of major lignite fired power plants, all operated by PPC. These represent nearly a quarter of the country's total capacity and generate almost half of its electricity. Most Greek lignite is produced by PPC. In fact, the company is the third largest producer in the EU, 
with significant mining operations in western Macedonia and the Peloponnese region. In 2012, total Greek production was nearly 62 million tonnes. Alongside PPC, there are also a small number of privately operated mines, and in 2014, these produced a total of around 2.6 million tonnes, some of which was actually supplied directly to PPC. And the photo here is just to show you PPC's Aeos Dimitrios power plant, the country's largest. This particular plant is 1,600 megawatts and has five units that consume nearly 20 million tonnes a year of lignite. So moving on to the power sector. <clears throat> Well, much of the Greek electricity system was developed after 1960 with the main aim of electrifying the country through the use of domestic sources of energy. On the mainland, this mostly came to be supplied by the national grid system, with the bulk of electricity demand being met by a combination of lignite and hydroelectric power plants. Many of the Greek islands that weren't connected to the mainland grid were supplied by standalone oil-fired plants. Today, the Hellenic Electricity Transmission System, otherwise known simply as the Interconnected System, covers much of mainland Greece, but now also some of the islands. It's got an overall capacity of around 18 gigawatts and includes 5 gigawatts of lignite fired plants, 4.9 gigawatts of fired on natural gas, and a further 700 based on oil. Large hydropower makes up a further 3 gigawatts, and 4.3 gigawatts comes from other renewables, mainly wind and solar. On the islands that lack connections to the mainland grid, the installed capacity consists of 1.78 gigawatts of oil fire generators plus around 450 megawatts of renewables. So the total national installed capacity is around 19.6 gigawatts. This is made up of 61% thermal power plants, 15% based on large hydropower, and 24% based on renewables. So, Greek electricity is generated by a combination of lignite, gas and oil-fired plants combined with hydropower and other renewables. In the case of the lignite plants, well, clearly a lot of Greek electricity continues to be generated by these, although since 2010 their overall contribution has decreased slightly. In 2010, they generated around 50% of the country's electricity, but by 2014, it dipped slightly to 48%. Turning to gas-fired plants, well, during the past decade, the use of natural gas for power generation increased significantly. Indeed, the appearance of the private sector gas plants has been a major factor in reducing PPC's market share from nearly 100% before 2009 to the current level of around 72%. There are now private power plants with a combined capacity of around 2.2 gigawatts, and independent producers have so far achieved a generation share of around 20%. During the past couple of years, Largely as a result of the country's economic upheaval, there was a steep decline in electricity demand. And here, gas fire plants were more affected than lignite units. The reductions in output from gas plants was mainly replaced by electricity imports. These normally amount to around 4%, but in 2014, they rose dramatically to 16%. So what does the future hold for the power sector? Well, Given the continuing economic crisis and austerity measures in place, it's difficult to predict precisely what the longer term holds for the Greek energy sector. Recent years have seen various forecasts made regarding its future scale and makeup. However, the country's ongoing problems will undoubtedly have a major impact on future events. However things pan out, in the coming years, the power sector seems set to undergo major changes, although many uncertainties remain. Many of these, in fact, centre on the future of PPC and its associated privatisation plans. When, or if this proceeds, and PPC is at least partially privatised, this would have a major impact on the structure and operation of the company, its generation assets, and the Greek electricity supply business as a whole. At the moment, it's very much a case of wait and see. And this table shows you the country's biggest lignite-fired power plants, they're all owned and operated by PPC. The capacity of the individual sites varies between 330 and 1600 megawatts, with lignite consumption falling between 2.5 and, and 20 million tonnes a year. Obviously, all is supplied with indigenous lignite, mostly produced from open cars mines close to the respective power plant. Some only generate electricity, although the top five of these also supply heat to local district heating schemes. So we'll move on to environmental issues. Well, Greek environmental policy in general is based largely on EU regulations and directives. 
Recent years have seen Greece pass important legislation and transpose a number of such directives into national law. The Ministry of Environment and Energy has responsibility for defining and implementing national energy and environmental policy, as well as coordinating the energy sector. Not surprisingly, a significant proportion of the emissions to air come from the energy sector. The widespread use of poor quality lignite is responsible for a large chunk of the country's emissions of SO2, NOx, particulates and CO2. However, for some years PPC has been improving the efficiency of its thermal power plants and upgrading their pollutant control systems. Major investment and efforts have been made to reduce emissions and these are continuing. So, PPC's emissions of SO2 and NOx have been falling. This has resulted from a combination of factors such as reduced overall power generation plus longer hours of operation of FGD plants. However, against this background, particulate, particulate emissions have increased slightly. As many Greek lignites have a high ash content and a low CV and are burned in large amounts, considerable quantities of combustion byproducts are produced. The biggest is between 10 and 11 million tonnes a year of fly ash. In 2012, PPC plants generated nearly 11 million tonnes of this, or only, although only 300 kilotons was actually utilised. The remainder was deposited in specially designated areas. And so, ash utilisation in Greece is much lower than the European average. Now, Greece has produced what's termed the Transitional National Emissions Reduction Plan. This was approved by the European Commission and covers the period from January 2016 to June 2020. The plan imposes a gradual linear reduction between 2016 and 19 in the total annual emissions of SO2 and particulates. All major Greek lignite fire plants are covered by this, although for a specific reason, several have been granted limited scope derogation. The strategy of adopting a programme of linear reductions in this way is intended to allow improvements and investment needed to be made in a, in a gradual and affordable manner. As part of the plan, PPE, PPC has set out its policy and defined how it intends to operate its fleet of lignite power plants during this period. It's determined what it needs to do to comply with the reduction plan and the necessary timescale for achieving these goals. Now in the case of NOx emissions, compliance is already required from the 1st of January this year. So, as part of Greek efforts to achieve the goals enshrined in the reduction plan and EU directives on the limitation of atmospheric pollutant emissions, PPC is undertaking a number of actions intended to control and reduce emissions from its plants, whether they be fired on solid, liquid or gaseous fuels. In each case, the overarching aim is to achieve high levels of environmental protection. Now, PPC's strategy to reduce its environmental impact is being applied across all areas of the company's activities, spanning lignite mining, power generation, transmission and electricity distribution. But turning to the control of SO2 emissions, well, the actual emission limit values for SO2 produced by lignite plants depend on a number of factors, such as individual plant capacity, its age, the characteristics of the particular fuel feed being used, and overall hours of operation. We mentioned earlier that the properties of Greek lignites can vary quite considerably and under some circumstances this can result in power plants experiencing irregular peaks in SO2 emissions. It's possible to minimise these by mixing and homogenisation of the incoming lignite. However, this approach may not always be adequate and consequently some plants have been equipped with limestone gyps and FGD scrubbers to control less emissions of SO2. This brings us on to what's termed dry desulphurisation. Usually, some Greek lignites contain high levels of calcium compounds. During plant operations, these react with sulfur species present and partially desulfurized plant flue gases, bringing down overall levels released. Under certain conditions, this allows some units to meet legislative limits without the need for back-end FGD. As you'd expect, dry scrubbing is usually quite a bit cheaper than wet FGD systems, hence its attraction. In Greece, after successful dry scrubbing trials, PPC took the decision to fully equip four units of its large Aeos Demetrios plant with dry desulfurization systems. Indeed, for future projects, wherever possible, PPC intends to opt for, opt for the use of dry techniques. But moving on to NOx. Well, as with SO2 emissions, NOx emission limit values depend on a number of factors. 
No Greek power plant currently deploys DENOX systems such as selective catalytic reduction, although some have adopted primary measures and or fitted low NOx burners. There are plans for others to do likewise. PPC plans to, to further reduce NOx emissions from its fleet through a 28.6 million euro programme. For example, as part of this, it will involve significant changes to all five units of its 1600 megawatts Aeos Dimitrios plant that we saw earlier. Under the terms of the National Emission Reduction Plan, compliance on the level of NOx emissions was required by the beginning of this year. However, in 2013, PPC requested an amendment accepting some of its units, and several others have also been granted a limited derogation. Now, when it comes to particulate control, Greek lignite plants have been equipped with ESP units supplied by a variety of technology vendors. Over the years, quite a few of these have been upgraded and improved to increase their efficiency. As part of this, starting back in 1987, PPC instigated a program for reducing particulates from its power plants. This focused mainly on replacing upgrading existing ESPs, plus the addition of new state-of-the-art high-performance units. This was carried out under the terms of the EU Directive on Integrated Pollution Prevention and Control. The program led to a significant improvement in ambient air quality, particularly in the areas around power plants. Significant reductions have been achieved, for example, between 2007 and 10, airborne particulate levels in the ptolemaeus Kozani region fell by 55%, the reduction at Cardia was 40%, 41%, and at Aeos Dimitrios it was 90%. PPC is continuing to improve ESP performance as suitable opportunities arise. We'll now turn our attention to some of the clean coal activities in Greece. In some cases, there's commercial-scale deployment, in others, large-scale trials have taken place, and in others, work has so far been at a small scale. So these are the areas we'll look briefly at. Obviously, each of these is discussed in some depth in the report. Now, at the moment, over 70% of PPC's lignite-fired units are more than 20 years old, while 46% are more than 30 years old. So, the attractions and advantages of a move towards higher efficiency neuroelectricity generation are obvious. By adopting modern supercritical technology, any new units will benefit from the lowest variable generation cost, lignite consumption will be lower than older units, CO2 emissions per unit of output will be lower, as will emissions of classical pollutants such as SO2 and NOx. PPC's existing lignite fleet currently includes one supercritical plant, and this is the Maliti power plant at Florina, shown here. This 330 megawatt unit started up in 2004 and reportedly has an efficiency of around 34%. It fires a low calorific high ash lignite sourced from the adjacent lignite mine at Florina. Now, prior to the onset of the country's financial crisis, new supercritical plants were being considered for several areas. However, at the moment, only one new supercritical plant, the 660 megawatt Ptolemaeus Unit 5, and we'll talk about this shortly, is being developed. As part of PPC's investment plan, a second unit, the 450 megawatt Maliti 2, has also been proposed. However, the project is currently on hold and seems unlikely to proceed before 2025. Progress after this date will depend largely on the conditions prevailing in the Greek electricity market at the time and what changes may have occurred in the sector within the meantime. But moving on to the project that is now well underway. In March 2013, the contract was signed by PPC for this new 660-megawatt pulverised lignite-fired plant. This will be the first major lignite-fired unit built in Greece in the last decade and is viewed as of, crit of critical strategic importance for the company. The new unit will operate on base load and pr replace some older low efficiency generating capacity. Annual generation will be, will be around 4,300 gigawatt hours and it will also provide around 140 megawatt thermal output for district heating for the town of Ptolemaeus. It's assumed that it will comply fully with Greek and EU environmental legislation. And annual lignite consumption is expected to be around 6.5 million tonnes a year. Reportedly, around 60% of funding for the plant will come from the German investment bank KFW. This will provide around 700 million euros towards the total estimated cost of 1.4 to 1.5 billion. As you can see, a generation license for the project was issued in 2010, the environmental permit for operation of the, the relevant lignite mines issued in 2011, 
and the environmental permit for the power plant itself was issued in May 2012. Now one of the other clean coal related areas that's seen quite a bit of activity is that of co-combusting biomass and lignite in existing lignite fired power plants. The potential of coal firing biomass has been increasingly recognised in various countries. It can provide a variety of benefits. Within Greece, several biomass materials have been assessed for their potential for coal firing and these are some of them. Coal firing has the potential to play a significant strategic role in energy production and some larger scale Greek coal firing trials have been carried out using combinations of lignite and a plant known as cardoon. This is a fast growing thistle like plant of the sunflower family. Now as we've heard the properties of Greek lignite can vary widely and in biomass such as this can act as a support fuel when the quality is poor or variable. Its addition can help smooth out some of the fluctuations and such was the case at PPC's Cardia power plant. This frequently uses lignite from a number of different sources and as a result there can be large variations in the properties of the lignite feed. As part of the major EU DEPCO project, co-combustion trials using Cardoon were carried out in one of the plant's boilers. Its addition to the lignite feed was indeed economically useful as it allowed access to generous feeding in tariffs at the time. The lignite used had a CV of between 5 and 5.5 5 megajoules per kilogram, whereas the cardoon was somewhat higher at 14 and 15. As part of the programme, pilot scale co firing was carried out using 1,700 tonnes of locally grown cardoon. What was the outcome? Well, generally positive results were obtained when this was added at up to 10% weight percentage thermal share. Co firing helped smooth out fluctuations in lignite properties and reduced overall CO2 emissions. In fact, the variations in lignite quality had a bigger impact on boiler performance and operation than the addition of the cardoon. So it was concluded that co-firing will be a beneficial option for both fuels. Work is continuing in Greece examining the combustion behaviour of blends containing higher levels of cardoon. In other Greek work, well, co-firing has looked at combinations of lignite with various forms of wood, agricultural wastes, municipal solid wastes and crude glycerol, However, most trials with these materials have so far been at a fairly small scale. Now, in the case of fluidized bed combustion, although there are no commercial scale lignite fired FBC plants currently operating in, Bre in Greece, at one time there was a proposal to build a 450 megawatt power plant in the Kazani Ptolemaeus area. Some Greek lignites have been evaluated in a range of different test facilities and confirmed as being suitable fuels for FBC applications. And co-combusting lignite with several forms of biomass in FBCs has also been investigated and a number of different combinations have been deemed feasible. In the case of gasification and IGCC, well over the past decade or so, largely in response to the country's high dependence on imported natural gas, the production of synthetic natural gas or SNG so the gasification of lignite has been examined. A number of projects have been undertaken and several candidate technologies evaluated. Some of these were shown to be technically robust with the potential for generating SNG from indigenous lignite. However, at the moment there are no commercial scale gasification plants operating in Greece and it seems unlikely that any such projects will be developed in the foreseeable future. Although an RDF fueled gasification plant is planned for a mafia. In recent years, a number of studies have examined the suitability of Greek lignites for use in IGCC cycles, some combined with CO2 capture. Some promising results were obtained, although there are currently no commercial IGCC plants operating in Greece, again, nor likely to be in the immediate future. So moving on to co-gasification. Well, the possibility of co-gasifying Greek lignite with other solid materials such as RDF or MSW has been investigated on a number of occasions. This included the feasibility study for a lignite RDS co-fueled IGCC plant to be located near Kazani, although clearly this didn't proceed. And finally, Greece was recently a member of a multi-partner project that examined deep underground coal gasification coupled with the permanent storage of CO2. The main objective was to evaluate the potential of deep coal and lignite seams at depths greater than 1200 metres for the development of UCG and to confirm that UCG boreholes could be used for injection and storage of CO2. Assessment focused mainly on coal deposits in Bulgaria, although it was considered that data obtained could be applied to the appropriate lignite reserves in Greece. So 
data, we'll now look at CCS, or Carbon Capture and Storage Activities. Now, within the EU, the energy and carbon intensity of the Greek economy is not considered to be exceptional. However, the carbon intensity of energy production is one of the highest, due mainly to the heavy reliance on lignite and, to a degree, oil. In recent years, nearly half of the country's CO2 emissions have been produced by public thermal power and heat plants. Between 1990 and 2010, CO2 emissions from the electricity sector increased by 20%. However, in the past few years, partially because of the economic crisis and the associated industrial slowdown, overall levels have fallen. However, whatever happens in the future, in terms of political events and changes that may occur in the Greek energy system, it seems likely that for some years, fossil fuels will continue to play a major role in the country's energy supply. Forecasts suggest that lignite, gas and oil will continue to provide a major part of the country's energy, particularly for its electricity generation, at least up to 2030. The present government's previously stated intention of increasing reliance on domestic lignite and further gas side capacity appears to have softened, and emphasis may be switching again towards a greater reliance on renewables. Following the most recent election of September 2015, the new Minister of Energy announced that the new government would now focus on the gradual reduction of fossil fuels in the Greek energy system and the further promotion of renewables. So realistically, we shall have to wait and see how this strategy pans out. Now, to date, most Greek CCS-related activities have been limited largely to studies and small-scale R&D, although some Greek organisations have taken part in various EU framework programmes. At various times, Greek energy companies and other industrial players have shown an interest in CCS, but this has yet to translate into a major project. However, for some years, CO2 emissions from the PVC-generating fleet have declined, thanks largely to its ongoing greenhouse gas reduction programme. Between 1990 and 2011, CO2 emissions per unit of electricity generated from PPC's fleet were reduced by nearly a third. These reductions were achieved mainly through improving existing lignite-fired units, sometimes coupled with restricted areas of operation, retiring some older lignite-fired capacity, and the greater use of natural gas and renewables in the generation mix. PPC has stated that it maintains an interest in CCS and its potential. And with this in mind, the new lignite fired 660 megawatt Ptolemaeus 5 unit that we heard about will be built CCS ready. So just to, to wind things up, the financial crisis continues to impact on all aspects of Greek economy. And realistically, there seems little to suggest that the Greek economy will enjoy serious recovery in the immediate future. As the country has a high energy import dependency with almost all of its oil and gas being sourced from abroad, it replies, relies heavily on fossil fuels. In fact, it's one of the most reliant of the EU member states. The only major energy resource is lignite, and the country has quite a lot of this. Unfortunately, most is of poor quality. However, it's inexpensive to mine, and it allows electricity to be generated cheaply. With regard to the uh, power section, sector, the state-owned PPC is Greece's largest power generator, electricity supplier and lignite producer. It operates a combination of thermal power plants and renewables. Combined, these account for nearly two-thirds of total Greek installed capacity. In 2014, lignite plants generated nearly half of the country's electricity. So what about the future? Well, recent elections appear to indicate some changes in direction in energy policy. And since the most recent... Contrary to earlier announcements, as we've heard, emphasis appears to be switching away from increasing the use of domestic lignite towards the greater use of renewables. Furthermore, energy sector privatisations may be on the table once again. So the, main, the power sector seems set to undergo major changes, although many uncertainties remain. My apologies. And finally... Clean coal technologies and carbon capture and storage. I mentioned that several forms of CCT are in operation, or have been the subject of commercial interest of various forms of R&D, and these comprise the technologies shown here. Partially as a consequence of Greece's financial problems, it doesn't seem likely that we'll see any serious large-scale deployment of most of them in the immediate future. The only exception would be the new lignite-fired Ptolemaeus unit that we spoke about, the supercritical one. Now, turning to CCS, well, this area was included as a high-priority research topic in the Greek National Energy Programme. To date, 
most Greek CCS-related activities have comprised small-scale work coupled with collaboration through various EU framework programmes. Technology providers, energy companies and other industrial players have at times expressed an interest in CCS, but this is yet to translate into a major CCS project. Irrespective of future political events and changes that may occur in Greek energy policy, forecasts suggest that for some years, fossil fuels will continue to play a major role in the country's energy supply, at least up to 2030. So in the longer term, and assuming that fossil fuels in general continue to make a major contribution, and of course that includes lignite, it's possible that potentially some form of CCS could be eventually deployed within Greece, although realistically this seems some way off. However, various Greek organisations, and that includes PPC, continue to maintain an interest in the technology. But that brings, you to, brings us to the end of my, my, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. My PowerPoint will be available to download from the webinar page of our website later on today. Now let's see if we have any questions come in. We have a couple here. <coughs> um, apart from obviously having to meet environmental regulations in place, are there any additional measures that lignite producers or users, users have to address? Uh, yes, there are, in fact. Um, Greek, like, Greek lignite producers, and clearly we're mainly talking about PPC here, have to pay what's called the lignite levy. This is uh, a, a special tax that's levied on all lignite mined in the country. It's generally termed an offset amount. Um, this generates funds that are used to pay for infrastructure and environmental projects and so on. It's used to support different sorts of activities and projects in communities that are located in um, specific areas that are affected either by lignite mining or its combustion. Um, PPC is, is clearly the biggest lignite producer by far, so it pays most of the levy. Uh, and as I understand it, much of the money raised goes to the prefectures of um, Florina, Kazani, and I believe Arcadia. The, 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 um, the, the level was formally set uh, at I think 0.4% of PPC's turnover, although in 2012 it was increased, I believe, to half a percent. I think in that year, PPC played out nearly 30 million euros to the fund. And on top of the levy, um, lignite fire power plants also pay an additional amount on each megawatt hour of electricity generated. As I understand it, this is allocated to um, different prefectures in proportion for the amount of electricity produced from the, uh, the lignite fire plants operating within that particular region. Uh, we have another question. Uh, you mentioned that many of the Greek islands still rely on oil-fired power plants. Um, have there been any plans to replace any of these with coal-fired plants? Uh, well, as I understand it, 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 it has been talked about on occasion, but as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any firm proposals made. But having said that, it was suggested a few years ago that the oil-fired plant on the island of Lesbos, for instance, could potentially be relocated away from the coast and adopt some form of clean coal technology. Um, this didn't happen, or it certainly hasn't yet. And I think given the present situation, I don't think it's very likely it will ever happen, in fact, on any of the islands. Um, on a slightly similar subject, there were proposals for the introduction of additional gas-fired capacity on Greece. But in this case, it was decided it would be better for, to go for a subsea interconnector to the mainland. It, it, it was felt they'd be able to make better use of the island's renewable potential. At, at the moment, there's nearly 300 megawatts of um, wind capacity installed on the non-interconnected islands with almost three quarters of this is on Greece. And so you can, you can see the potential there. Uh, we have one more question. Did not see coal beneficiation as a CCT option. Uh, this is in fact discussed in the report. Uh, it's, it's not really applied widely in Greece at the moment. I think largely as, as the sort of cost of producing lignite for, for coal fire, for lignite fire power plants is, is low and the intention is to keep it that way. Clearly beneficiation adds, adds cost and complexity to this. Although I do discuss this in the report and the advantages it can provide. Well, that, that seems to be the end of our, our questions. Thank you very much for your attention. The next webinar from the Centre will be by Hermani Hermane Nelbandian Sugden, and her next webinar will be New Regulatory Trends, Effects on Coal-Fired Plants and Coal Demand. 
Thank you very much for your attention. If I can help any further, please just email me and I will I'll do my best to address anything, anything you wish to ask. Thank you and goodbye.